we're going to go ahead and we're going to go ahead and get started. I, I remember as a kid, they used to tell us, "What is the early bird catches the worm?" Well, <laughs> um, we're actually a little bit late for this panel, but this is this is a beautiful moment, and I like to set up this part of the panel by saying two things, um, two words: shoulders and fabric. Now, why is that important? If I gave you a piece of leather and asked you to make a wallet for me, what would affect you being able to do it would depend on the quality of the leather. If I give you leather that's well cured and everything, you'll probably make that wallet in no time. If I give you leather that has to be pulled and stretched, it's going to take a while. Remember that point. Shoulders. Many in here, many of us, and probably all of us, like to say we stand on the shoulders that went ahead. And that's true. But what many of us in here need to learn to do is be the shoulders now for those who are here. With that said, I want to say I am indeed honored, pleased, enthused, fired up to be on this panel just to do the presentations. And I'm going to shut up so that we can be enlightened by some good fabric. These, these, these are not students on a field trip. Know that. These are students who haven't come to listen. These are students who can lead just as well. Let me tell you who we have. We have, who will be speaking on Building Campus Peace Action Clubs, will be Kate Alexander from the Peace Action of New York State. We have a speaker who will be speaking on recruiting students on Mass campuses, on Massachusetts campuses. That will be Caitlin Forbes from Massachusetts Peace Action. We have presentations on experiences at Fordham University. And the two representatives from there will be Eric Stoller and Emma Budd. And we also have bringing activating, a, a, a presentation on activating faculty is Luisa Canasis from MIT. You can give them a hand now. And, and because Caitlin has a, another commitment to make, we're going to let Caitlin kick us off. And Caitlin, I surrender the mic to you. Hi everyone, um, I'm Caitlin, and my other commitment is actually to meet with a student um, who's interested in building a chapter, so quite literally exactly what we're doing here today. Um, so I apologize for having to duck out on you, but I hope you understand it's all in the name of peace. Um, so yes, I am the Student Outreach Coordinator for Massachusetts Peace Action, and what that means is I work with the, um, the different student groups. I work um, with them once they're up and running and helping to move them along, which I think Kate's going to talk a lot more about in terms of um, New York's work. Um, but I also help actually, you know, build those chapters and get them off the ground and find the students who lead them. Um, and those students are really the, you know, really the backbone of their chapter. If we don't find the right students to lead these chapters, they don't happen or they start and then they quickly fall off. Um, so it's really about finding these really passionate students um, who care about our issues which is not always the easiest thing to do because I think we all know there is a disconnect but with the peace movement and um, a younger generation. And I don't need to tell you guys that. There we, are, we already know that. Um, but so it's about trying to find these students that can bridge, bridge that disconnect. So um, I'll give you a little bit of just kind of like the nuts and bolts of what we do. And then I'll talk a little bit more about um, some like the deeper impact I, I like to think we have. Um, so in terms of nuts and bolts, we do a few things. Um, we, first of all, we consider student organizing an, an internship, so a formal internship with Mass Peace Action. Um, we think that this is helpful because it gives the students um, a, sort, a certain amount of um, authority and um, they know right away that what they're doing matters. It, it has an actual role. It also, in just a purely logistical sense, um, gives us the freedom to post this on internship job sites. Um, so all different schools have um, an internship site that you can post on. Many of you probably know this. Um, but we do make sure we post on all the Massachusetts sites. Um, and that's great. And it's definitely helped us reach a lot of college students. The internship is also really attractive for high school students, right? Because um, 
you know, perfectly honest, they're looking to build their resumes for college, um, and they internships are not something that they can frequent on as, as easily as college students. So it's a really unique way to reach high school students, and we've been really successful there, which um, I think is something that's a little bit more unique to Massachusetts and that we're really excited about. Student I'm going to meet today is a high school student. Um, so that's just one of the things we do. We also definitely try to connect with the professors on our campuses and the teachers on our high school campuses. Um, when we have connections there, direct connections, we reach out to them. You know, we ask, do you guys know a student in your classes? Do you know somebody who might be interested in taking on this role? Um, and we make sure that we have materials to give out so that professors and whoever can circulate the word. So it sounds very obvious, but again, making posters that are really clear about what we're looking for, making it really clear about what our mission is and what we're trying to do. Um, those are just some of like the really the basics of actually just getting the word out there, active on social, making sure that we're out there on social media so that students um, can engage with us in the work we're doing on a medium that they're familiar with and care about and that they can like quickly digest what we're offering. Um, so all of those things we do. We also try to attend events um, like these and meet students here um, who you know might be interested in joining. And all of that together has been really successful. Right now we have um, 10 different chapters um, in Massachusetts, hopefully 11 after today. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's definitely working for us. Um, that said, some of the bigger kind of parts of this that I want to mention is um, thinking that in that message that we give to students, that we think about, again, what I mentioned at the very beginning, how to bridge that, that gap that exists. And one of the ways that we found to do that is to connect with their passion for social justice movements and for that, for that kind of activism, which we know peace is so incredibly connected with and nuclear is certainly connected with when we think about the budget and we think about moving our money. Um, but students don't always naturally make that connection. So if we make it for them, if we make it really clear that if you, know, if you care about Black Lives Mattering, if you care about um, your education and your student loans, if you care about those things and the fact that there are all of these inequities that exist, um, this is a movement that can help you tap into this and we're giving you a role where you can do so at your campus and you can be a leader and you can make a change. Um, we also make it really, really clear that their, go their voice is going to matter. We let them know that we know there this is a gap that exists and that's why we need their voices. We need them. We make that really clear. They're going to have a leadership role. Cole has made it so they can join um, our board. We've had success and failures there, but you know that opportunity is there and it's very real for them. And the fact that they have that opportunity, that they know they can have that kind of leadership role at Mass Peace Action, that gives them you know, that feeling of legitimacy that they deserve and that we want to give them and makes them more likely to join us and to stay with us. Um, so that, I think, is a huge part of our recruitment pra um, practices and that I would certainly encourage anyone to do who's you know, trying to build these student chapters. And then the last thing I'll say, I really have no idea how I'm doing on time, um, is that once you, know, once you do have the chapter or the students that you want to work with, um, or once, once they're coming to you, you know, do push them a little bit. Try to find out you know, why do they care about this. Again, you, we, while we do want to show them that this can be helpful for them with you know, college applications, future jobs, et cetera, this, you know, we want them to know that we're trying to help them out. We also, of course, we want students that care, right? So we do want to weed out people that are just there looking for a resume builder. Um, while you know, acknowledging that that might be a part of it. Um, so do push them. You know, we, I, I have interviews. I have one-on-one -on -one interviews. That's literally what I'm going to do right now to try to find out you know, why are you interested? What do you want to work on? Um, if, you have, if your interest is vague, that's not a problem as long as the passion's there. Um, so that's, that's our process. Um, and then we just move forward into supporting them into the actual um, campus work, which again, I think Kate's going to talk a lot more in depth about. Um, but yeah, that's, that's us. I want to start by acknowledging the Wampanoag and Nepomset indigenous peoples on whose historical and stolen land we're currently standing. Because I don't think that we can even begin to unravel the global occupying force that is militarism without also addressing racism, sexism, and economic starvation, aka capitalism, as other global occupying forces. Um, so the way that I am gonna address this is I wanna echo some things that have already been said today and put, kind of talk more about how to build an inclusive conversation that students want to be a part of at the forefront and then say how we've done that through our campus organizing program. I think a lot of, I've been a part of a lot of peace movement rooms where uh, people have asked sort of why aren't students here? Um, and I want to posit that uh, 
And, and like, why are they in these other spaces and not here? We don't understand. This is so important. So really, like, to the room, what do economic justice, environmental justice, gender justice, and racial justice campaigns do that you don't see the peace movement doing? Every organizer should be asking this question. Because I know, I know personally as someone who also did not start in the space of anti-war organizing that I have very specific answers <laughs> to that question. Um, number one, in racial justice, gender justice, um, economic justice, environmental justice organizing, there is a clear um, understanding that experience is expertise. End of story. Experience is, in fact, invaluable in a way that expertise can be recreated, but, ex but experience cannot be. So when I enter a room, I'm not entering it just as a young person. I'm entering it as a young, as a person who has experiences that are no less valuable because of my age and no less meaningful to me because of my age. I enter this room as someone who grew up in Tucson, Arizona, a community where the average annual income is $37,000. Most of my life, my parents made a combined income less than what I made my first year out of undergrad um, with my bachelor's degree. In that community, on my high school campus, there is a recruiting center, uh, which for most students is gonna be the only way they have any kind of access to college. This year is the 17 year anniversary of the 2001 AUMF, which means that on my high school campus, which I hadn't even started going to when the 2001 AUMF um, was authorized, uh, there will be 17 year olds enlisting with parental permissions in wars that weren't authorized in their lifetime. And that happens this year. And pers just personally, as someone from that community, it's something that I can't stop thinking about. So, versus in peace community rooms, we talk about expertise is a barrier to involvement. Expertise is a barrier because so many of the really helpful information that we've gotten through this conference is only available in research papers or dug dig deep into a website or, um, or in, in conferences like this, which aren't accessible to everyone. I think it's important then to see that we have to be able to have entry points for people at every level of knowledge. You, and we have to go to where people are now and not expect them to come to us. You can't reach new people using the same methods. It doesn't work. The way that we institutionalize this at Peace Action New York State with our campus organizing is we have a dedicated, we have interns all year who are working on lists of professors at college campuses on which we do not already have a presence. We target eight to 10 professors and academic chairs um, on every campus on which we don't have a presence within New York State. And we email them before every semester or at the end of the spring term to get a, a new organizer there in the fall semester to say, hey, you probably have students who are already really interested in these issues. We want to work with them. Here's our organizer description. And by far and away, that is how I've gotten some of the most incredible student organizers. Number two, and I also want to say on the experience of, and expertise side of things, this directly addresses the language in which we, the language we use to talk about this issue. We've heard a lot of people talk about nuclear issues from the perspective of sort of um, the, the, econo the economics and the finances and all that, and that's so important, but I don't know about you, but when I talk to someone from the Marshall Islands about nuclear weapons, when I talk to someone from Japan about nuclear weapons, when I talk to someone from Guam about nuclear weapons, um, the language that is used is one of unparalleled loss. And we can't lose that. We can't lose that in our organizing because that's the language that is personal. That's the language that does tell the emotional story. That's the language that's, that acknowledges people's experiences. That's the language that makes sure that we're not rendering invisible our own history. 
And if we don't have those people in the room, we risk losing those stories, particularly of the Japanese hibakusha, because generationally, they won't be here very soon. The second, so that, and that goes back to Stephanie's point that she made at the end of her presentation um, from the Cost of War Institute, that we have, we have to bring back the fact that these are ultimately stories that we have to tell. Number, the second thing that economic justice, environmental justice, gender justice, racial justice organizing does that we don't is active outreach and resources for technical trainings. I know that when I'm in the office, and one of the reasons why our chapter is kind of effective is because, and I'm sure that many of you in this room have done this too in other settings, there's like backwards planning. <laughs> um, there's backwards planning. There's how do I write um, an email that's gonna get people to act? How do I write a call script? Which foreign relations committee people am I targeting? Where do people in the peace movement learn that? Like the very, the very, um, not, not the information side of it, but the, the technically, how do I find this? Technically, how do I, what's the difference between a cold contact and a warm contact? Technically, what are the rules for engagement in, um, like, on the street demonstrations, what do I have to do? I learned all of that from other movement spaces. I did not learn that in the peace movement. Because there, and there are trainings like this that, students and community organizers have, have to be actively investing in. There are trainings like Netroots Nation, like Power Shift, like Roots Camp. Um, there are national organizer meetings with, that bring in activists from across the country run by groups like the um, Friends Committee on National Le Legislation and the One Campaign and Results and uh, that actually focus on how do you, how do you lobby. Um, I don't know any place that has as accessible trainings like that in the peace movement. Um, which is something that we have tried to address through an annual student peace conference where we pay all of the cost um, for our student organizers and their activists on campus to be able to attend a training and we bring trainers in. Um, Code Pink has been involved in this training in the past. Uh, we've had Amnesty International provide uh, de-escalation and NVDA trainings so that they're able to actually like feel like they're walking away with a tangible skill that turns them not into just peace activists but into informed, responsible organizers in whatever movement space they choose to be in. Number three, there's a question that we need to be asking people who are in the room for the first time and which organizers often don't ask, which is, how did you hear about us? Um, like, what got, what got you into this room today? Because if you, if you are using the same tactics and it's not working, you deserve to know. If you're using a new tactic and that's what got someone into the room today, you should know. If it's, whether it's, maybe someone will say, I saw it in a flyer, I saw it on a Facebook group, um, I'm connected to you guys through this person. Like, that's, inc that's important information that you can learn from, and it tells you how to be more effective in your own organizing. And it also, to me, re like, re reverse engineering how people got into a space, uh, it's, it's also a way of sort of breaking down this like concept of students as like an alien being. <laughs> like, I don't understand them. <laughs> uh, wait, we have no idea what they're interested in. Oh my gosh, like, like no. I mean, I'm sure that I'm in the room for the same reason why many of you are in the room. I'm sure, and the, what got us here, a lot of that is, is really relatable. Um, and I don't think that intergenerationally we're having that conversation. But if you think back to like what, what happened that got you politically engaged, and if you can reverse engineer that, you're going to be able to get more people into the room. Um, and the fifth point is leadership pipelines, um, which is just 
is so important. And it, I mean, I, I'm, a, I'm an advocate of learning the best techniques from other sectors that you can. And leadership pipeline is definitely a private sector thing. Um, it's definitely that kind of terminology. <laughs> but what I mean by that is like, I am so excited that one of my former student activists is now working for Code Pink. I think that's amazing. <laughs> um, but there are like really limited job opportunities in this field, right? Because it's, it's like a small field. And even so, when there are job opportunities, it's a fellowship that requires like a graduate level education um, or a job that's like a senior director kind of position and you need 10 years experience. And for people who are really interested in doing this work, there's just, there's not a lot of like entry level stuff out there. So whether it's through like your grant making, uh, your grant requests or something else, like please think of ways to incorporate program staff to actually support your work. Um, this is really nerdy, but the smartest way I've seen this done was by, I think it's like Human Rights Watch and their budgeting. It's not like there's a separate line item for staff. It's like, this is our program in um, the Africa's division and staff is a part of it. So when you're asking for, um, find, for funding for like the Africa's program, you are asking for program staff, it's incorporated. We leave that out way too much. Um, because I, at this point, when I, my students graduate, my question that I'm asking now, after they've gotten like materials that speak to real human stories that you can relate to, after getting material, after getting technical trainings, which only happens after we find them where they are and reach out to them through their professors, is uh, where do they go when they graduate? What space exists for them? Um, like. This is a new generation where we are all in incredible debt and every time you are in college, you are being uh, told that you have to um, sort of choose one thing and just do that one thing. Uh, and honestly, economically, it's difficult to get beyond that. Um, so if they're, if they're if they developed as leaders and as advocates and as activists with technical skills and a real ability to speak to these issues. I mean, I, I know for a fact that my student organizers know more about the military budget than some people on the House Foreign Affairs Committee. Like, I know that to be true. But where do they go? Um, one thing that we're working on right now is we have a Peace Action alumni group, and I think all of your organizations are listed on a list that actually suggests places where they should be looking. But I want to really encourage you to think about what you do with people when they're off campus. Do they even have, are there even resources out there for them to do something as a volunteer? Does your organization offer that? Do they have the ability to create a new chapter of a group? Are there clear volunteer roles with descriptions that they can share with their peers? I mean, I know that this sort of seems really like fundamental, but it's, it's really fundamental and it's, it's largely missing. Um, and then I guess the last piece that I wanna say is um, I, I just, is I want to go back to the expertise place. Actually, no. Um, yeah, I do. And I want to say another reason why I'm here. I'm here because I was a student activist who, when, who was part of a Model UN meeting when someone from an organization called Jubilee, Oregon, which does debt relief work, came into a Model UN meeting at my school and said, we, we would like a student organizer of a stand up for the Millennium Development Goals event on this campus. Does anyone want to do it? <laughs> and I was the like reluctant person who said, I guess. Um, but my point is that I, there was no litmus test for that role. She gave me the opportunity to try something new and to fail. She gave me the opportunity to be mentored and to have a significant even decision-making role amongst what became a group of organizations that include people whose work I still follow and love to this day, who I was able to learn from. And I wanna just encourage those of you who are in positions to do this to number one, go to campuses and 
try to find the contact information of Model UN and Amnesty and Peace Action and other groups so that you too can offer opportunities where they are. And number two, to give, don't keep students locked in a room telling them over and over what to do and exactly how to do it. Give them the chance to try. Give them the chance to fail. And when that happens, or they don't do something exactly the way you ask, first ask yourself, am I just being nitpicky because I would have done it differently? Does this also work just as well? And number two, don't tell them that they were wrong. Give them instructions on how to do it better. Make sure that you're not telling people that there's no space for them exactly as they are, exactly with what they know in the work you want them to do. Make room or they won't come back for it. We'll have um, Emma Bud and Eric Stoller from Fordham University. So, um, just to introduce ourselves first, um, the experience we're really going to be hitting on today is we are co founders of a new student group we have at Fordham University called the Humanitarian Student Union. Um, it is just a group we started with a few other students to kind of spread the awareness of political advocacy on campus and to give power to other youth on campus knowing that a lot of the time we are not included in these conversations because it's assumed because we're 18 to 22 years old that we don't know politics or we don't know how to organize or we don't know what advocacy is. And um, independently, it, all of our founding students kept saying, well, we've seen this. I know myself, I've had the opportunity to take over 100 students to um, Washington DC and lobby before we even started this club. I've had the opportunity to register a lot more of that to vote and things like that. Like the experiences are there and we have the know how to do so. Um, so we really wanted to take that on on our own. Um, I'll take a little step back and to give you like a frame of where we're coming from and what our interests were in starting this. Um, I'm an environmental studies major, poli sci minor. I focus in environmental regulation, politics, and government. So I was really trying to connect this to how is this affecting the environment? How is this affecting relations between not just other humans, but humans and other species, humans and animals, um, people of different races, ethnicities, genders, everything you could imagine. Um, I'll let Emma introduce herself and kind of give her interest into um, why we started our club before we move on further. So I'm Emma, I'm a sophomore at Fordham. I am an international humanitarian affairs major, um, which we'll get into in a minute, but we're actually one of only about six schools in the country that have this program for undergraduate studies, um, which is really cool. And I'm a double minor in French and history with a concentration in Afro-European relations, and I'm on the pre-education track. So the reason that I'm interested in this is really the budget problem because I am interested in education and I want to go into the education field, the fact that it is not getting the funding it needs because of the nuclear weapons industry is devastating. Um, so. Yeah, so um, <laughs> starting this group, how it really first started is that department we just spoke about, the one that's uh, one of six in the country that offer an undergraduate degree in some field of hum humanitarian work. Um, they kind of reached out for feelers for undergraduate students and said, we're a new department. There's very few in the country that exist like us. We want input from the youth. We want input from ad undergraduate students. How do you think we best can do that? And um, there was a f our first meeting of about 10 to 15 people that showed up and said, okay, we hear you. We hear you want to hear from us. What's this relationship you want to build? And it kind of came down to the idea that the best idea or best way to go about this is to create a club on campus, create a space for undergraduate students to come together and discuss these issues, discuss things like nuclear disarmament, discuss things like ending tensions between um, the United States and North Korea, where they know their voices is taken um, seriously, but we also have the opportunity to bring in professionals who have been working in the field much longer than we've been alive. So it's understanding that yes, we are of are the younger generation, and the older generation does have experience that we do not have, and does have time, uh, a lot of time above us that we just can't catch up with, but, knowing that we still have an opinion that matters and we still have that voice that matters. We still have the know-how to get some of these things done. Um, we'll talk about in a little bit a fundraiser we were able to do that we thought was a great success 
just starting from the ground. Like literally we made it in six days and it was one of the best things I've been a part of thus far. Um, but this group really, we started from the ashes, nothing existed before it and we had lots of roadblocks. It's been about exactly a year since mm -hmm. we started it and we're still not officially recognized by the university. We but have no budget. <laughs> yeah, we have no budget, we work with no money, um, but luckily we have the humanitarian department that's been working with us and um, it kind of sparked this grassroots organizing effort on our campus within our own little hub that was really cool to see because we were starting to see kids from different majors coming to our meetings, from different departments, um, from different focuses and passions, which is something you really usually don't see on a college campus. You see the um, biology kids sticking with the biology kids. You see the politi like political science kids sticking with political science kids. I mean, we got a couple of business students at a meeting a few weeks ago. That was really exciting. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, new for us. But uh, like Eric was saying before, we started the club underneath the institute and initially it was supposed to be a safe space for people to come in and talk about issues that they were seeing with other people who were interested in them. Um, and as it grew and as we got further into it, we realized that we wanted to start doing fundraisers and having um, speak outs and just really being active and advocating for what we believed in. Um, and after that, we started to realize that we wanted to become our own club and not necessarily be underneath the department anymore. Um, so we applied for club status, which we're still waiting on, um, as Eric said before. But even in the last year, without any budget, and being underneath another department and what they want from us, we've done a heck of a lot. So, <laughs> so the event I was kind of alluding to earlier, um, right after the hurricanes in Puerto Rico, we noticed that there was a lot of students on our campus specifically that didn't know a lot of what was going on. There was a lot of confusion in the news of what conditions were really like in Puerto Rico. And there was the understanding that humanitarian aid was needed. There it was the understanding that there needed to be a response from the political system. So literally at like 8 p.m. one night. It was um, the week after the hurricane. Yeah, happened. the week after the hurricane, it was like 8 p.m. one night. We were sitting with a couple of other students. I think it was us and a couple freshmen that said, we should have a fundraiser. And I, in my head, having organizing experience, I was like, okay, how's a month from now sound so we can get <laughs> all the work done and get everything lined up? They said, no, next week. And so that's what we did. And within an hour and a half of having this program starting, we raised over $1,000, all just from university students coming through. <laughs> Thank you. So like that just proved to us that like under the, the common thing you hear that undergraduate students don't care or that the youth don't care about politics or this kind of thing, that just proved to us that was wrong. Like mm -hmm. I would never expect college students to donate $1,000, let alone in an hour and a half. And a, a we just had plus, food like, at. Physical donations, we had like toiletries and blankets and food and um, we were able to drop all of that off at one of the fire departments near our school. Um, but that event was really the first time that I realized that we were doing something that was going to be substantial and sustainable. And um, we were very surprised by our turnout. We, like, like Eric said, in five days pulled this together. We managed to get food donations from a Puerto Rican restaurant near our school. We had... Um, campus ministry supporting us with getting a uh, space to host it because without club status we need um, people to rent spaces for us or we can rent the spaces underneath their name um, and we had students coming in and the other thing that you hadn't touched on yet that I thought was really important and I know you did too is that we have a lot of students at Fordham who are Puerto Rican and whose families might still be there and who were deeply affected by this and they all came to the event and they thanked us. And like that was one of the most like profound moments for me that I've had in the last year being a part of this organization. And so like a big argument I wanna make through us like highlighting our experiences at Fordham and how we've been able to do this is, um, though you might not see a lot of students come to events like these, or you might not see a lot of students that are um, jumping right on the bandwagon to lobby for a bill, the demand is there and the want is there. Students are there, they just, don't know the language, how, they don't know the language to do this, they don't know how, or on the flip side, they don't feel like they can because a lot of the time, students are included in these political discussions or they're not included in um, advocacy efforts where clearly the, the capabilities are there. And my argument is, why should we wait until a student finishes with a graduate degree before we give them political advocacy experience, give them a toolkit when they're young so that by the time we get to be out of school, we already have the experience, we have the know-how, and we have something to prove for it. So like, what I want to argue is that there needs to be that mutual beneficial relationship between the younger generations and the older, where you got an uh, older generation's gonna want um, 
the youth to be included because they either want to see this carried on or they want the voters or they just want the numbers there and the youth want to be included because we're passionate about these topics. But we don't want to go to a room when we're just told, okay, sit there, look pretty, we'll talk about this, learn something, jot down a couple notes, be quiet. That's not the way those conversations work and that's why students don't show up because they're afraid of that. They want to come and want people to approach them and say, what do you think? Or what's the topic you want to advocate on? Or what's your home senator? Let's look up their voting history. How can we counteract this? And so um, like, I'm hoping that we're getting the message across that us young people, we do care. We know how to do this. We've done it before. A lot of us have done it before. It's just we need to be included. We, us young people can't say old people are crazy and they're not going to change their mind because obviously not true. And the older generations also can't say, well, these young kids are just naive. They need to learn and get an education first because at the same time, that's also not the case. It's a give and take relationship. And I don't know if you have more to add. Just briefly to second what Kate was saying earlier, that doing something differently doesn't necessarily mean that it's being done wrong. And to start something is to do something differently oftentimes. And I think that when we look at younger generations like us and how we are starting movements and starting organizations and trying to make our voices heard and advocate for what we believe in, it has to be understood that it's not always going to look the way it always has because when we look back at in history, organizations and movements that have been successful were always something different. Hi everyone, okay, um, I have a couple things that I'd like to talk about today. Um, the first one I'm going to move pretty quickly through because I think everyone who spoke on this panel gave amazing experiences and advice for campus organizing specifically. Um, so I'm only gonna talk briefly about what I did as a student, um, as a student organizer on MIT's campus. Um, and one reason for that is also that MIT is a very unique place and what worked at MIT will not work at every school. And conversely, what works at most schools probably wouldn't work well at MIT. Um, John knows what I mean. So uh, what I did, um, before I got involved with nuclear weapons stuff, and that's what I do, I'm a nuclear weapons person, nuclear disarmament. Before I got involved with that at MIT, there was a Global Zero chapter, but when the woman who was basically running it single-handedly graduated with her PhD, Nobody really stepped up to take over. Um, and actually, uh, Professor Aaron Bernstein, who gave the opening talk this morning, tapped me and asked me if I wanted to take over. I was a little wishy-washy, but we ended up having a conversation and deciding that maybe the best thing for MIT campus was not a continuation of the Global Zero chapter, but a different organization that could promote um, a level of concern about nuclear weapons and nuclear disarmament without having as explicit a political stance. Um, because MIT's campus and MIT's community is very skeptical of activism and of political agendas. Um, there's, there's a sense that um, we're all very smart people and we all know better sometimes. And people don't like to be told what the solutions are to these problems. They want to reach them themselves. So I think that was a challenge for the Global Zero Club on campus. What we ended up coming up with in its place was a group that was intended to raise awareness and discussion of nuclear weapons issues. And the reason for that is because I think the answer is obvious. I think if you engage with these issues, you can't find a conclusion other than we need to disarm or, you know, there's something a little wrong with you maybe. Um, but we can't just say that because no one will listen and they'll think that we're just telling them what to think. So uh, we formed a group called MIT Students for Nuclear Arms Control. And the types of events that we did on campus were um, film screenings of, of course, Dr. Strangelove um, and other events that were more focused on educating people on the facts. And the discussions that we had at those events did lead to our goal of promoting disarmament, but we didn't tell people to come to our events to promote disarmament. And here that made a big difference. I think at a lot of other college campuses there is not the same sort of reluctance to engage with politics and to engage with existing stances. Um, so I think Global Zero is a very important group and I think that promoting explicit disarmament is something that's really important. And so I don't want to tell people not to do Global Zero. I want people to just think about where you're working, 
which people you're working with and what your audience is, because at MIT that was a challenge. Um, so a little bit more about what we did. Um, we were not an official MIT student group for the first couple years. I think we're in the process of applying now as well. Um, we have received a lot of support financially and otherwise from MIT's RADIUS office, which is the Office of Ethics, and specifically Trish Weinman. I'm not sure if she's in here or if she's outside, but either way, she's awesome, and we owe her a lot. Um, the group, uh, it mostly reached out to students on campus, and we have continued to struggle to have a strong student base. But one thing that is really encouraging is that whenever we held a big event, um, we got people that we had never seen before. And those people almost invariably left seeming like they had learned something new and meaningful. Like this was not something where they went in, they thought about nuclear weapons for an hour, and then they went home and never thought about them again. Even if they weren't joining our group and meeting up with us every couple of weeks, I do think that those students left with a serious concern about nuclear weapons. And that was really our goal. Um, this actually is a convenient transition to what I'd like to talk about for a slightly longer time, um, which is the Nuclear Weapons Education Project. Um, and that is when it says activating faculty um, for my subject on this panel, that's the Nuclear Weapons Education Project. So the Nuclear Weapons Education Project is the brainchild of Professor Aaron Bernstein. Um, he has been thinking about this for a few years now, but about two years ago, <clears throat> he's formed a group of volunteers from the MIT community, including a few faculty, some students, including myself, um, some graduate students, postdocs, about eight people. And we would just meet about once a month and kind of talk and brainstorm about the role of education in the future of nuclear weapons. How, what can we be doing in education to reduce the risks of nuclear war in the future? And the objective of this project is to introduce information about nuclear weapons into existing college classes, and especially introductory college classes, because I took classes about nuclear weapons, but almost no one does, of course. People are interested in what they're interested in, and most people are not going to become nuclear weapons researchers. So we want students to be going to their history classes, to their English classes, to their physics classes, and having a lecture or a homework problem or an exam problem that causes them to engage critically with these issues of nuclear weapons in a context that's something they have to do anyway. Um, and so this is something we're trying to promote. <sighs> trying to figure out how to make that happen has been a challenge. Um, one thing that we've been working on is developing a website to serve as an educational resource for professors and instructors who do not have a background in nuclear science, who do nothing to do with nuclear weapons, but who are interested in taking part in our project and sharing some information with their students in the context of their classes. So um, <clears throat> originally that website was something we were working on in that small group. Um, after I graduated from MIT in June, I actually started working on that website full time for five months um, and some other duties as well as part of the Nuclear Weapons Education Project. Um, but it's still a work in progress because the the research task of aggregating, um, I guess I should step back and say what the website is actually about. The website, if you look at it, it's, um, I'll write it down on the board later, but it's um, nuclearweaponsedproj.mit.edu. And the goal for this website is that it will be basically a quick resource for professors to look at a long list of topics relating to NUBIST and then look at these other reputable resources which we've vetted to get more detailed information and build a lecture or build a question or homework problem. Um, so this is a large task to produce a website that has all of these different topics and all of this information presented in a readable way. Um, so what we're actually doing now is we're getting students involved in the production of the website, which I'm really excited about. Um, MIT has a research program called um, Undergraduate Research Opportunities that makes it very easy for undergraduates to participate in paid research. And we are using that as a way to get students involved because what we do for the website is research. So now we have a group of four MIT students who are working 10 hours a week to research nuclear weapons topics of their choosing and develop these summaries, these overviews, these educational resources for professors on our website. Um, once that website is done, although 
I say that loosely because, of course, it will always be updated, and it actually needs to be updated now on the North Korea page. <laughs> um, we want to share it as widely as we can with professors, and we want to act as like the individual people involved, myself, Professor Bernstein, um, Professor Robert Redwine in uh, the MIT Physics Department. Uh, we want to serve as resources for interested professors as well. We want to be available to help connect them to resources that they could use in planning these lectures. We want to be able to share the lectures that we've given or prepared with them as a resource. Um, so one of the big steps that we are dealing with now is outreach. Right now, our network is primarily made up of physics professors and physicists from across the country um, because Professor Bernstein traveled and gave a series of uh, physics colloquia talking about this education project, and it was very well received. Um, physicists, in general, um, according to Aaron, I wasn't present, uh, are really supportive of this project, and they're really supportive of the effort to expose students to these issues of nuclear weapons basically whether they like it or not. Um, and I think it's really important because I didn't get into this in high school. I started studying nuclear weapons stuff because I took a class on it. And the only reason I took a class on it is because it seemed interesting and I was already doing nuclear stuff. It's a very specific case. Um, but the main thing is that the exposure to nuclear weapons is what got me to go into this field as my career. Um, and I think that that will be true for other people. So um, before I finish up, I have a couple more things to say about what we're doing now. Um, one major problem with the education project, as it has been up to now, that I didn't really think about, it was pointed out to me, and I think it was very wise, is that if we only operate at the university level, it's inherently cutting off a huge portion of the population. And that's cr incredibly true, especially because this project started at MIT. You know, it's a great school, but it's not representative of the rest of the world. And the people that we educate here are not going to suddenly spread their influence. Like, educating people at MIT is a very, very specific thing to do. And we want to reach more people. So one thing that we're trying now, um, I'm currently in DC with the Center for Arms Control and Nonproliferation as a Scoville Fellow. And I'm continuing my work with the education project there. We're currently trying to um, get a deal with the DC public schools to do some lectures in DC public school classrooms. Um, and try and build off that to have some sort of relationship because I think ultimately the public schools are really where this message needs to be. Of course, it's very difficult to do that. But the reality is that people my age, people of my generation grew up after the Cold War. We were born after the Cold War and none of us have any exposure to nuclear weapons in any serious way. I mean, I remember watching The Iron Giant when I was a kid and that was, you know, I didn't even know what it was about, but now I watch it and I'm like, this is crazy. Um, <laughs> so nuclear weapons weren't in my middle school curriculum. They weren't in my high school curriculum. They weren't really in my college classes until I sought them out. And I, that's why people don't know about them, of course. People get their information from education. So I'm really dedicated to this idea that educating students at the high school level, at the university level, at every possible level is vital to preparing them to become our future leaders and our future citizens and our future organizers. Um, I think that the, the fabric, the leather um, analogy is really good. And what we have been trying to do with the Nuclear Weapons Education Project is just start pulling the leather before students graduate, before they start looking for a career. Just get them thinking about nuclear weapons, realizing that they exist, that they're a problem, and engaging critically with the questions that are raised by that. Um, I don't think I have, oh, okay, yes, one last thing to say. <laughs> um, the other thing I wanted to note is that this project is starting to spread to other campuses. Um, Temple University has been coordinating, or specifically um, professors Bernd Suro and Jim Napolitano, the head of the physics department there, have been working very closely with Aaron, um, and they're working to bring something like this to their campus and to bring a dedicated class on nuclear weapons to their campus. So it's really heartening to see that others are listening and that what we're doing at MIT is spreading, even if it's still only spreading at the university level. Um, and we're trying to get our message out there. I just wrote a blog post for my current job about the project. Um, we wrote an article for the MIT faculty newsletter about the project, which hopefully will be coming out soon. Um, and 
we're trying to write an article for the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists about the project. So that'll be the big one in terms of exposure to the rest of the world. But we really hope that others will see what we're doing, see that our work is having effects, and you know maybe take up a similar model at their own school because ultimately it's a lot of work, but someone needs to do it, and we just started doing it, and now it's happening. So that's all. <laughs> I don't know about you, but for me, it makes me like, wow, this is so refreshing, so good. And we should be proud. This is our front line on the campuses. And they are working. Not my words, take it from them, but my word is I'm with them. Anyway, here we, we will take some questions. They're ready for any of your questions. So if you raise your hand, I'll start out there with Andrea. I can get you an invitation, which I can, to the school with the high school without walls in Washington, D.C. Yes, yes. Would you go? Yes, definitely. All right, setting it up. Ooh, that's what I'm talking about. I thought I saw a hand on the second row. Did I see your hand? Okay. Is there another question? There we go. I go up top and I come down to Medea. Yeah, I'm What investment in student organizing yeah. that MAPA and that PANIS have been making. Um, I have been lobbying with students on U.S. involvement in um, the Saudi led coalition in Yemen since 2016. This isn't a new issue for students. Yeah. And in fact, I think it's one of the most relatable issues in a way and one of the most galvanizing issues because it's so clear that the U.S. is so wrong. Um, it has some of the best like general educational materials I've seen. It, it doesn't have the same barrier, like expertise barrier that nuclear weapons can have sometimes. Like this is a very, this is an issue that I, I know students have been involved in since 2016. Um, I don't know if you want to speak at all to the MIT organizing around it. But. So I can't comment too directly on um, the MIT response because I'm only here for the weekend. I don't um, live here anymore. But I just want to thank you for pointing out that there was that editorial response. I did hear of his visit at the time, and I was disappointed, to say the least, as probably a lot of people were with the warmth with which he was received um, and the secrecy involved. But um, it is unusual, I think, for the, the tech to run a front page editorial um, denouncing this association. Um, they, the tech specifically has not always taken a very activist bent. Um, I would say that it has not taken an activist bent. So um, it's promising. I mean, it, I obviously give credit to the people who organized, who raised awareness, and who made MIT students and the MIT community care about this issue. Because having just graduated from MIT, I could easily imagine a world in which there was no commentary on it whatsoever. So thank you. Medea, and then Jonathan. Oh, why did you go? Um, I just want to say, um, uh, Louisa described uh, Aaron Bernstein's efforts of, uh, over many years to contact his, his colleagues who were physicists they wanted to teach uh, about this. I had Gary Goldfield for about a few years. The other thing that is even more effective with faculty is when students come up to you. And so for the students here, you don't have to know the physics faculty in your campus. You can look it up, find out who teaches physics. One, go approach them as a delegation from your group and go out and say, gee, you know, students here really should learn about what happened in Hiroshima and Nagasaki when you teach about fusion, fission, and fusion. Because usually they teach about fission and fusion just, just in, the, in, in the abstract. And when a student comes to you and asks you to include something in the curriculum, it's so exciting, yeah. you know, that, that, that they care. It's, uh, you know, it's usually effective. Yeah, and when did your experience at, um, trying to get universities to that end? Yeah, um, so we have students who are organizing at Hofstra now to get divestment. And um, the biggest barrier I, to it in general is that and, and not even a barrier really, but which like shifted the conversation is this issue of information. Because there's so many ways in which military money is flowing onto their campus. It's scholarships, it's funding buildings, it's part of the endowment. Um, I had a student who actually 
when we were at the Code Pink Divest conference, got like a recruitment email from someone. And it was just like, well, first of all, you've chosen the wrong person incredibly. Um, but it's just, it's, so their first question really, and what has become sort of their organizing and advocacy question there is like, where is our money coming from? And why is our university investing in like, in the end of our future instead of a sustainable future? Um, so I think that like it, what was really helpful for Hofstra is what was initially perceived as like a roadblock became like a new campaign that was actually, because it's asking a question that like the university should have an answer to, um, has actually been um, a really great way to build a really large coalition. So they've been tabling, I mean like weekly for months at this point with just like petition signatures trying to get, um, I think it's, the development office to release specific information on what money is coming into their university. Alex? Specifically, I am gonna go home and Google it though, so I do take it seriously. Um, I will say, I don't know if this is the same thing or completely unrelated, but there is an issue of um, increased drone presence over a lot of our nuclear sites, which may be surveillance or maybe, um, who knows, but I don't know if that's related or not. So I am inclined to not dismiss you um, or dismiss the question as ridiculous because of the drone issue, and um, I will definitely Google it. <laughs> and I see, oh, yes, Elaine. I have a question that's um, I would love to address this. Uh, sorry, just because like my, my other hat is that I'm finishing my MPA at Columbia and Humanitarian Policy and Gender and Public Policy. So I'm gonna like <laughs> try to control myself. Um, <laughs> I think it's a really important question that is often handled really indelicately, in particular by like traditional liberal feminists, because there's this tendency to say women are more peaceful, women are like somehow going to solve all of the world's problems and we won't have any of the same challenges that men do. Um, which just, frank, like, frankly, when I, when, and I, you know, I mean, when we see, it's true that women's involvement in peace processes leads to the end of violence faster and peace agreements last longer. That's like, that's just a factual statement, but I think that's because you have more voices with more perspectives at the table suggesting more solutions than it is because it's their gender. Um, when you get to like the nuclear weapons and gender question, uh, so first of all, you, we, you can't start the conversation by saying women are only peaceful because there are like, there are the Tamil Tigers, there are women who have been involved, there are women from, who have been involved in um, Honestly, like the Islamic State and the Taliban, there are women in our own armed forces. Like, there, like women have as many roles to play in the world's crises as men do, but often they've been blocked from them. So, like, like let's not engineer an idea of how women will use their agency for them. That's like the whole problem. Um, so that, but on the issue of nuclear weapons, the, the, I think, um, and it's true that. Uh, where you get into want that question of how it relates to toxic masculinity is that toxic masculinity um, celebrates aggression in men and militarism and patriotism in this country celebrate aggression in nuclear systems. Mm -hmm. And because those two framings both celebrate aggression, you have more men in nuclear systems. And the toxic masculinity part is about questioning, like, like, is it right to assume to have an aggressive posture at all? Like, isn't there, so isn't there a better framing for our nuclear weapons um, policy that acknowledges that exactly what has been said throughout this conference, which is that um, there, North Korea, in particular, is an example where there is a clear limitation to the like mutually assured destruction idea of deterrence, right? Because if any country even has one weapon that we think might work, it has the possibility of plunging 
everything into chaos. So if we can step back from like an aggression framing and celebrating aggression nuclear policy um, in the same way that we need to, st to um, stop celebrating aggression in a way that frames like masculine agency, then we can get to a solution that actually like makes sense. <laughs> Because I would personally really like to get to a place where we recognize that war itself is idealistic, that the idea that it has ever solved anything is mm -hmm. idealistic, so we can work on other solutions. But I, th I think that that's where the toxic masculinity part comes in. And yeah, if you want to add anything. Yeah, I, I think you hit it pretty spot on, but I wanted to put um, a finer point on it, because I mm -hmm. think you 